The Society for Vascular Surgery has recently decided to sponsor a series of audiovisual interviews of the leaders whose contributions have led to the evolution of vascular surgery to a recognized subspecialty. A committee was formed, chaired by Dr. Jimmy Yao, to undertake this project. Along with Dr. Yao, uh, Norman Rich and me were named as members, with Cal Ernst serving as consultant. Newer members have been added to give a younger uh, persona in this uh, committee. These include Bill Baker, Mark Escandari, Melinda Kibbe, Peter Lawrence, and Walter McCarthy. Recently, Bill Pierce has been added. My name is Roger Gregory, and with Jimmy Yao, today we will be interviewing the world-famous surgeon, Dr. Ken Maddox. Ken is known as Mr. Trauma, a.k.a. the Houston Hurricane, <laughs> also the Renaissance Man of Trauma. Dr. Maddox is very difficult to pigeonhole. Trauma surgeon, cardiovascular surgeon, perhaps the last of the true vascular surgeons, or perhaps the minister of the truth. No matter how you categorize, Ken, thank you for agreeing to this interview. Thank you. Let's start off with your early years. <clears throat> Tell us about where you were born and your parents. I was born in White Oak, Arkansas, which is 15 miles north of Ozark, Arkansas. White Oak was was, had a population of uh, some 15 or 16 people when I was born. My dad was chopping cotton for 50 cents a day. The work ran out at six months of age, and uh, we left, and the town became seven as two couples left. For five years, we were migrant farm workers in California, and uh, all of my um, relatives on both sides of my family are still dirt farmers in, uh, in Arkansas. Wow. I'm the only one on e either side of my family to go to college. Wow. Tell us about your mother. My um, mother uh, was from White Oak as well, and uh, her folks migrated back and forth between Waxahachie, te Texas, and uh, Arkansas. Uh, milk cows and uh, didn't have electricity in their house, didn't have running water in their house, and uh, uh, they had uh, a two-room schoolhouse where everyone went to school all 12 grades, and one school teacher that taught all of those grades. Wow. When you went to grammar school in the two-room schoolhouse? No, no. I, uh, I left Arkansas at six months, <coughs> went to California. My early uh, schooling was in Southern California. My dad moved around. Uh, by the fourth grade, I was in El Paso. By um, I uh, graduated from high school in Clovis, New Mexico, went off to Wayland Baptist University. It, at that time, it was Wayland Baptist College, 300 students. I went there on a ministerial and a music scholarship to be a Baptist preacher. And I was in the a cappella choir where um, I, uh, I uh, was paid for my uh, singing. I went there as a very uh, uh, shy, meek individual. And it was uh, the music that taught me to project my voice, and um, I haven't stopped since. <laughs> Tell me about your decision to go to medical school instead of divinity school. I um, was in a school that uh, had a lot of preacher boys, and in my studies, it seemed to me that they uh, didn't think very deeply. As a matter of fact, Early in the first course of the first semester, I fell in love with sciences. And because I love zoology, they thought I was an evolutionist. So they came to my room and said, we're going to pray for you. And I said, please do. I need the prayer and you need the practice. And because they were so hypocritical, I revolted against it. And uh, uh, it was the science of medicine and uh, the sciences and the chance to go into medicine that really uh, was amplified during those first two years in a non-science school. 
and ultimately I came to Baylor College of Medicine. How did you finance all this, Ken? I, um, I held two jobs while I was in um, college. I, I, of course, had the scholarships and undergraduate. And uh, uh, I built fences, and I uh, uh, worked in the lab, and worked in stores, and I actually saved money while I was in college. And while I was in college, I married uh, the school nurse, uh, who is still my wife after 52 years. Wonderful. And we came to Houston, and June was the head nurse on uh, MD Anderson's pediatric floor. And she uh, invested in me and has stayed with me. And um, I borrowed, I had one scholarship that I ultimately paid back uh, and uh, uh, finished with no debt. Terrific. Now, how did you choose Baylor? This small town boy from a ministerial college, how did you choose Baylor? How did you decide to go to the big city? Once I decided I was going to go to medical school, I'd already established sort of a philosophy of life. When you have two choices, you always take the highest, hardest road. So I began to look at colleges, and I looked at Baylor, and I looked at a number of other uh, uh, medical schools. And um, Baylor seemed to me to be kind of tough. And uh, the competition was greater. And I said, I'm going to go there. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, after my interview, I was offered a position, and, and I accepted it. So you finished medical school in 1964. In 64-65, you interned at Ben Taub Hospital. Was it a trauma center then? The American College of Surgeons designated trauma centers and developed the formal program in the 70s and really became sophisticated in the 80s. So it was not a trauma center as we know it today. However, it is not appreciated by many people that the first, the first use of the word trauma center was used by Dr. DeBakey when he came to Houston in 1948-49, a grant from the U.S. Army and the trauma papers written by Dr. DeBakey then have written in them the Jefferson Davis, predating Ben Taub, mm -hmm. the Jefferson Davis Trauma Research Center. So the word trauma center was used by Dr. DeBakey fully 10 years prior to uh, Cook County and Chicago or Maryland shock trauma formalizing the word trauma center by uh, uh, Dr. Freark and R. Adams Cali. So Dr. DeBakey was the first to use that term. I learned of that when I wrote a paper indicating that Cook County and shock trauma in Maryland were the first trauma centers and Dr. DeBakey was a co-author on that paper. I sent it over for him to review and to proofread and it came back with a lot of red marks with um, <laughs> reprints of the papers he had written in 1949 and 1950 with the word trauma center on them, underlined, highlighted in yellow, and I had learned my lesson that I had not done a thorough search. And of course, Medline did not exist, but he, he taught me then that uh, it was a trauma center, but not under the same sophistication as today. Now, after your internship in 1965 through 67, you went in the military service. Now, what is this about an aviation accident research center at Fort Rucker? How did you get involved in that? I was part of the civil service, the draft activities, and I'd registered for civil service uh, um, <coughs> when I was in high school. As I finished medical school and, and was going into the, in, was an intern, I received the notice that I needed to go into the Army. Dr. DeBakey was chairman at that time. And uh, uh, I went to him and said, uh, I, I, I really want to start the residency. And he said, don't worry about it. I know Lyndon Johnson. I'll get you declared a, a, um, 
uh, essential resident. Well, it didn't work. They almost <laughs> drafted me as a private. And so I went in the <clears throat> Army late, about three months late. As a result, I was assigned to the U.S. Army Aviation Accident Institute at uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama, a full colonel position. And here I was a captain. And I realized that I was to be assigned there for three months and then go straight into the highlands of uh, Vietnam. So I started working very hard and the general liked me. And uh, the person that was going to come and fill my slot uh, ended up being sent to a clinic uh, on the base and I held that job. So I started investigating aircraft accidents helicopter accidents, and my very first paper is indeed uh, looking at patterns of injury, long before I knew I really liked uh, trauma. And uh, uh, it was an outgrowth of Dr. DeBakey's inability to keep me out of the Army, which put me in the Army late, or I would have uh, had my first assignment into the Central Highlands of Vietnam. Then you became an aeromedical consultant at Natick. Under, as I understand, stood the Natick situation there. That was under the Surgeon General's office. Well, I was a consultant for uh, uh, uniforms, survival kits, burns, and I was part of the development of the Nomex uh, flight suits. This was at a time when fire retardant material was. Uh, uh, not as sophisticated as it was to, is today. And race drivers were not required to wear no mix at that time or other fire retardant material. Uh, I helped design uh, the aviation helmets at that time and continued to do so uh, with them after I got out of the Army while I was still uh, uh, a resident and uh, continued to work with various branches of the military uh, all the way through the Gulf Wars in uh, approaches to the care of the injured, building upon the MASH hospitals that Dr. DeBakey built on, but also looking at resuscitative techniques, um, evacuation techniques, and it's really been a great ride. Now you go back to Baylor to finish your surgical residency followed by a thoracic surgery residency all at Baylor. <coughs> then practice. Why stay at Baylor? I um, knew I liked a, the Baylor environment as a student, as an intern, as a resident, because um, if you think about the 60s and the 70s, these were extremely exciting times. Oh, yeah. Advances in vascular surgery, advances in cardiac surgery, advances in trauma, and advances in critical care. Four areas that were wide open, and I participated in the development of a lot of the initial research, the instrumentation, the gadgetry, the technology in each of these four. And in the early years, the persona, the genome of the individuals who made contributions in these areas were identical. The center of the universe, as you know because you were here during those times, the center of the universe for that activity was here. Yes. One day I counted over <coughs> 88 cardiovascular cases being done in and around the Texas Medical Center in one day. You could pick and choose to see anything you wanted to see in uh, cardiac and vascular surgery, vascular trauma. And uh, this was the place to be. It was the center of the action. And I wanted to be at the center of the action. So, meanwhile, you told me you had already gotten married to June. How many children? Um, I have one daughter. We have one daughter. and. Uh, uh, you know, surgery residents work very hard, and in order, so uh, uh, she was exposed at least on one occasion. <laughs> well, Ken, let's return to your academic career. We've talked about why you chose an academic career, 
In the early 70s, you were instructor in surgery, but by 1984, you were full professor. Wow, that's moving fast. Tell me again how your, your career path led to a focus on trauma. I uh, <clears throat> took my general surgery residency and was selected uh, by Dr. DeBakey to possibly be a White House fellow at the end of my general surgery. And that's tough competition. And in the last month before the 1st of July, I did not uh, make the final cut. Uh, so there was an unexpected vacancy in thoracic surgery at Baylor, so I fortunately got that. I finished my thoracic surgery, which was two years, and Dr. DeBakey came to me and said, we have two jobs. One, you can work with me in the big room at Methodist where the big bad cases are done, or I need someone at Ben Taub to ah. take care of surgery there. Uh, after some thought, I chose the Ben Taub, partly because I felt that the indigent sick of this county need the same quality as those people who could choose which hospital they wanted to go to. Plus, Methodists had lots of competition already, right. and there was really no one but George Jordan, who was at that time becoming ill, to do the teaching, to do the research, to do the surgery, uh, and to expand uh, on um, the surgery program and to build, and so I chose uh, the Ben Top. Good choice for everyone involved. Ken, you've received every known award, including the Legion of Merit from the United States Army, Presidential Citation, Distinguished Alumni Award, multiple teaching awards, AOA. Of which of these awards are you the most proud? They're all different. Probably the best, the one that I'm most proud of is not listed as an award, and that is the legacy of the people that we train who dot the world as master surgeons wherever they go. And that is, to me, the greatest award that a teacher could ever have is that their pupils exceed what they have done. Wow. But uh, the specific <clears throat> award that uh, was the most humbling uh, occurred this year when the Rotary Club of Houston, the largest Rotary Club in the world, uh, recognized me as the Distinguished Citizen, uh, Distinguished Citizens Award. Fifty times that's happened in Houston. And the awardees are Leon Jaworski, Michael DeBakey, Denton Cooley, uh, and uh, the individual, uh, Barbara Bush, George Bush, uh, Bob Lanier, who owns the uh, Houston Texans, and on and on. And all of them are people who, who have buildings and various things named after them and are real legacies. I've worked at the Ben Taub, and so in selecting me, it was sort of selecting those people who choose to toil in the unknown parts of healthcare delivery. And uh, so it was a recognition of Baylor, a recognition of Bentob Hospital, a recognition of uh, the doctors and nurses who work there nameless year after year, and the commitment of this community to quality healthcare to those people who don't have a choice. Terrific. Ken, you've been the speaker <clears throat> in over 800 hospitals, universities, meetings. In the face of all this success, were there disappointments? What can failure teach that success cannot? The disappointments occur probably when a patient doesn't get better when we give our best. And so a loss of a patient in the operating room an operation that didn't work the way we thought it worked causes us to go back to the drawing board and say, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a simpler way. We've got to be able to do this 
in a faster way. Or maybe there's a total different approach. So every time we have had a frustration on a clinical problem, I've gone back to say we've got to do some research. This doesn't compute. And so we've built on that failure to say there's got to be a better way. Ken, I'd like to talk now about several focus areas to highlight certain areas of your career. The first is books. Books are very hard to write, and yet you've been super productive in this area. First, your book on trauma, currently in its seventh edition. Top Knife, translated now into 10 different languages. A book on general surgery that I've <clears throat> talked to several people who were laymen, who read it and loved it, were able to read it. A very unique style and format to this book that I'd never seen before. Vascular Trauma, now in its second edition, co-authored by another world-famous trauma surgeon, Norm Rich. The History of Surgery in Houston, very colorful recount of the explosion of the Houston community. And finally, Sabaston's General Surgery text in which you are now co-authoring the 19th edition. How did this happen? One of the things that was the knock on the Houston program was lots of papers, no textbook. You solved all of that. How did that happen? One is able in the operating room to talk to one resident or two residents you're working with. In the classroom, you're able to give a lecture. In a textbook, you're able to meet faceless thousands of people. And now on the internet, tens of thousands can be reached with a single stroke of the pen. Using the media we have to communicate is really what makes one of the things that makes man different than animals. Being able to learn from someone else and then be able to put that in a, in a way that others can comprehend it and use it uh, is really something that's been natural to me since I was in high school. I like to write. I have been blessed with office personnel, uh, Mary Allen, who edits a lot of what I write and takes out a lot of the nonsense and puts it in a good syntax. But also, I like to write just as we're talking, just as we're in a coffee room after a case. <coughs> I like to write in that style so that someone understands, uh, they know what they're talking, I know what I'm talking about, and this can help them and they can use that. Now, if one has that skill, it, you might as well, while waiting on an elevator, while waiting for a plane, just using that time t to write. Uh, I probably have another 10 or 12 books, books that have never been published, that are just out there to be written, to be, to be distributed. Jimmy I've written, gonna... I've written some that are not even on medicine that have to do with things like medical Machiavellia, on how you run an office, how <laughs> you survive in academia. Um, and uh, some of them uh, in, that, that are even outside of, of healthcare uh, uh, in general. And it's kind of fun to sort of dot those around. I even have different names for the internet, to have a different personality, to talk to different groups be they political or be they uh, ethical groups. We're going to have a suggestion for another book for you shortly, a little <laughs> bit later in the interview. Let's go back to trauma, Ken. You've mentioned how this focus came about and how Ben Taub got into the picture and became the trauma center that it, that it is today. <clears throat> Let's talk for a moment about your Las Vegas trauma meeting, which incidentally is probably the largest, most prestigious trauma meeting in the world with an audience that had to be limited, I was told, 
to 1,200 people. Cut off. No more can come in. Having attended this meeting, I can attest to the fact that you run a smooth, no-frills, hard-hitting meeting that provides up-to-date facts. Further, you do a Ken Maddox original by, at the end of the meeting, review each paper and highlight a take-home message. This is incredible. How did the Las Vegas meeting come to pass? Uh, Cuth Owens, uh, Hank Cleveland, and others started this course uh, over 45 years ago. I inherited it about 25 years ago as the program director, and uh, it was about 300 attendees uh, every year at that time as a peak meeting. I was challenged because other people at that time were trying to develop trauma courses around the country, and the competitive nature, always take the hard uh, road. Rather than badmouth them, I said, I can best them by besting the conference. So I asked the question, what do the people who come to this course want and what do they need? And I decided to create a course that was cutting edge, new, that would give them something that would help them with a real-time patient the day after they went home. And it so we created that. And uh, year after year, I get calls within the week with tears in their voice uh, that what they learned changed their practice mm -hmm. and changed their practice to save somebody's life, um, including from the war zone. Uh -huh. And uh, that spurs me on to say, that's good, but we can do it better. How do we do it better so that next year we can cause more people to be more comfortable in their practice with complex cases. Taking the high hard road, we then look at trauma to say, those are the big bad cases. Mm -hmm. How can we teach tricks to surgeons for those big bad cases that help them during times when they're most frustrated? And that's what's driven us to be the blueprint for that course. Is that how the Maddox maneuver started? The medial rotation of viscera occurred uh, when I was a junior faculty. No, I was a resident, I was a fourth year resident. My chief didn't come in, my faculty didn't come in, and I was with a urology resident. And we encountered a case we didn't know how to expose because there had been three previous laparotomies. And the guy had been shot in the aorta, vena cava, right and left kidney, pancreas and spleen side to side, and he had a frozen belly. And the only way we could get there was to work out a new operation to go retroperitoneal through the transverse alus fascia. And uh, lo and behold, he lived. And during the next two or three months, we had other similar injuries, and they all lived for an injury that we looked up and found that 60% mortality was Routine. not uncommon in good trauma centers. <clears throat> And uh, so we wrote it up. Well, as a real compliment to you, I can't imagine a trauma surgeon who doesn't use the Maddox maneuver. Well, sir, <clears throat> in all due respect, <clears throat> the message I have to the world now is that procedure should not be done <laughs> anymore. <laughs> you lose six units of blood <clears throat> in doing the, the maneuver and indeed, today we have new technology. So using the new technology, be it balloon occlusion for temporary control, or be it the insertion of a stent graft to uh, gain control and then have a hybrid procedure for revascularization of the visceral mesenteric vessels, is a way now we can do the operation without losing the blood, and we have already applied that. We just don't have enough cases to write up yet. But indeed, we ought to use, use the new technology to do things better. And we use the medial rotation because 
The anterior approach was not good back then. Progress will continue to be, to be made by people who uh, uh, build on our foundation, and that's what's exciting about surgery. Ken, when you were president of the American Association for Trauma Surgery, you've been described to me as their most effective president. What were your goals? What were you trying to do? I really don't remember that I had a goal as, as president except to uh, bring people together, to expand the scope of the organization, uh, uh, to acknowledge the students and residents and trainee, uh, training. Uh, prior to that time, uh, uh, it was tough to get into AAST. And uh, it's now opened up some. It's fostered other organizations such as EAST and the Western Trauma Association. And then to bring a network of the trauma organizations together. I actually formed a new group uh, called FOTO, F-O-T-O, uh, that met once and unfortunately it didn't meet again. That's Federation of Trauma Organizations. I, ha I brought together in Houston some 12 or 15 different groups as a strategic planning group. Uh, the nurses, paramedics, emergency medicine, critical care uh, medicine, uh, as well as the trauma groups and others to, uh, to say where should we go together in the future. Photo has not taken off, but the, the, the consolidation, the communication of these organizations uh, uh, has continued. Also, <clears throat> you've been inv involved in legislation at all levels. How can trauma care be tr legislated? The approach to trauma care is probably the most systematic, scientific, engineering in medicine feat that exists in America. If you think about it a moment, the network of trauma in, in, across the United States, indeed across the Western world and now in Europe, um, is, uh, is extremely sophisticated in that uh, we talk to each other, we have state organizations, we have local organizations, and during disaster we link extremely well. And so the network established by the American College of Surgeons, AAST and others, is applicable to healthcare delivery. Indeed, healthcare, politics, disaster management are all local. They're not centrist. And the solution to those issues in Texas is different than California, is different than Massachusetts. And the lessons we have from medicine and trauma uh, are really applicable today to uh, healthcare delivery, whether it be uh, uh, at the presidential level, the congressional level, or the state legislative level, indeed. We're gonna come back to uh, medical care in a few moments, but I'd like to also talk about, under your focus on trauma, the fact that you've been such an inspirational speaker, dramatic, effective, always offering a takeaway message. Was this a carryover from your early aspirations for the ministry? Uh, who knows? Um, <laughs> I've, had, I've had some wonderful teachers. Somewhere in my past, uh, I've had teachers say the following. Uh, you can lead a horse to water and you can make them drink if you put salt in their mouth first. <laughs> you can sugarcoat the pill of, of knowledge and cause people to have a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So in teaching, in preparing a lecture, one can sugarcoat the pill of knowledge. You can cause one to want to know that new knowledge. So whether it's a PowerPoint presentation, whether it's an after dinner talk, I always try to take a different approach. What do the people need? What do the people want? What message do I want to leave? And then I make a very complex talk and then I tear it apart 
and reduce it to very simple terms and really only two or three take-home points. And really that's what a preacher does. You know, this is what I'm going to tell you. These are the three <laughs> points. I'm going to have a prayer. And these are the three things I said to you. Now take up a collection and you can go home. <laughs> Ken, the management of natural disasters has been one of your interests and focuses, hurricanes, floods, so forth. Tell us about that. There are a lot of disasters that occur, and there are probably 10 times more experts in disaster than there are disasters. So disaster management and planning has become very, very complex at the federal level, at the military level, at the local level, and there's lots of names of lots of groups. Disasters um, are always with us, and there is a civil defense issue or civil issue of rescue and shelters. There is a public health issue of clean water, clean food, and then there is the medical aspects of disaster. My focus has been on the medical aspects of disaster not the shelters, not the search and rescue, uh, not the uh, uh, searching of buildings, but at the hospital level. And I learned early that there are triage, there is surge, and there's a 10% rule. The people who survive any disaster, airplane crash, earthquake, or whatever, only 10% are really bad sick. And it's our job to find that 10%. And of that 10%, only 10% of that group then require an immediate operation. The rest can be taken care of tomorrow and tomorrow. But if you think about that a minute, at the hospital level, managing that declared disaster is actually simpler than a busy Friday night in the trauma room. There are fewer patients after a disaster in the, tr in the emergency room and in the operating room than on a busy Friday night. During a disaster, you have all these people that are hangers-on that just show up that you really don't need. So managing a disaster at the hospital is just like managing a busy trauma. Hmm. You allocate people, you make triage decisions, who goes next, you utilize your ICU, and you determine the surge. So applying that to the hurricanes that have come to Houston, uh, the, uh, uh, a course, and we've added a disaster course yes. to the trauma course in Las Vegas, uh, seemed logical to me because in all the courses I went to on disaster, we were all hung up on incident command. It's important to know but we lost sight of the fact of what we really needed to do. And we did silly things. We created a special disaster tag for the disaster that no one knew what to do with because we didn't use it every day. So my message has been, you merely amplify those things you do every day in EMS, in emergency medicine, and in trauma when the big earthquake comes. Uh, when the big tsunami comes, and you apply those same regional, simple management principles that you would to a complex vascular case, it suddenly makes a difficult problem very manageable. Stick with your, your principles. Ken, <clears throat> there continues to be vascular trauma in the war zones, Iraq and Afghanistan. I can remember you giving advice on a case in the OR in, in Iraq through your telephone when we were at the trauma meeting. What lessons have been learned now from vascular trauma in Iraq and Afghanistan? We've learned some wonderful lessons. We've relearned some lessons. And we've identified some areas that are crises for the future. Let me address them separately. Uh, we have learned that damage control, putting a shunt in an artery, allows for the saving of a soldier, the saving of a wounded warrior's limb, 
to do secondary revascularizations in uh, Lonsdale or even in the United States. We have learned that the extremely wounded soldier has a window of time, just like we do in the ICU, that we do we don't do a procedure, but we're getting them stabilized. They're now stabilized in an airplane as they transport from the war zone all the way back to uh, Lonsdale and then to the, uh, various places in the United States. We have learned that the conditioned wounded warrior uh, is tough and is young. And we've learned that raising the blood pressure is bad and that it pops the clot causing more bleeding and that crystalloids increase inflammation and if you're going to replace lost blood you need to use blood not crystalloids and you need to use blood components of red cells, platelets, and plasma. And we've learned the value of plasma. We've learned what do doesn't work. We've learned that the various stuff that you cram into a wound doesn't work well. We've learned that uh, some of the solutions you put into the veins uh, to make clot happen doesn't really work well. It costs a lot, but it doesn't work well. Uh, we have learned that endovascular therapy has a place and there's been in some areas uh, the adventure into uh, uh, endovascular surgery. We have learned that a trauma registry, a vascular registry, as Norm Rich started in Vietnam, is really uh, allows us to analyze uh, the success or the failure of a different mode. We have learned that a weekly trauma conference linked around the world among the people who treated in the field, who treated at Lonsdale, who treated the surgical hospital, who treated the United States is extremely valuable, not only to the patient, but also as a teaching. We have also learned <coughs> that the general surgeon who is finished in the last 10 years is scared to death of vascular We've learned that the vascular surgeon trained in the last 10 years, although adept in endovascular techniques, is not trained in trauma. And the linkage between these two in the crisis of war has shown us that we don't have enough training in either, either specialty. The general surgeon was the gatekeeper for vascular trauma in most hospitals in the past. General surgeons today are not sophisticated enough in vascular disease to be that gate gatekeeper until they have had quite a, a bit of experience in the war zone. We have learned that the military is not training enough vascular surgeons in vascular trauma to satisfy their needs of their, of, their co of their United States hospital, much less the war zone, so that the vascular surgeons that the military have have to be deployed over and over and over again, right. supplemented by vascular surgeons from practice. There's only a certain length of time when that formula is going to work. If we have an another, another war like the Iraq War, Afghanistan War, tomorrow our supply of vascular surgeons or vascular surgical capability is sorely lacking. Yeah. Even at a time that the budget for the Uniform Medical School's budget is being cut back, consolidation of military hospitals is being cut back, and RRC, RRC requirements for vascular experience by the general surgery is being hampered yeah. tremendously. I think this is a perfect formula for a crisis and a perfect storm of a lesson we're going to have to relearn. Right. One thing Dr. DeBakey said over and over again at the Uniform Services University Medical School was, uh, it's a shame with every war we have to relearn the mistakes we made in the past. 
and now we're approaching that paradigm back into having to relearn lessons sometime in the future. I hope we can avoid that. Ken, you've mentioned Dr. DeBakey several times, and <clears throat> as we all know, uh, Dr. DeBakey was considered the modern father of vascular surgery. You had a 40-year association with this man, also acted as, as I well know, the back, backbone of, the, of Michael E. DeBakey International Surgical Society, never assuming the presidency. Can you talk about this association for a few moments and, and, and about the man himself? When I interviewed for medical school in 1959 at Baylor, they showed me a bunch of DeBakey movies that he had made during the 50s. And introducing the movies, they said, everybody knows Dr. DeBakey. And I said, I don't. <laughs> and I felt embarrassed when I said, who's DeBakey? Um, I learned the next year who Dr. DeBakey was when I came to medical school. And uh, at that time, he had an office at Baylor. He even would park his car out in front of Baylor and leave the motor running so that he could come back to the car and lose <laughs> no time as he went back to the hospital. Um, he was a busy man then. This was 1960, and he had a very busy practice. During that decade, he became president of Baylor and actually increased his practice while he was president of Baylor when it became an independent school. He was always working. He always was working on something, but he was probably five or six or seven different personalities. He was one personality in the operating room where he was focused on the pathology and attention to detail, absolutely mandating the pursuit of excellence. He was a different person at the bedside where he was giving confidence to the patient. And they saw a very calm, easygoing, compassionate Dr. DeBakey that I just left the operating room when he was telling me what all I did not know. I saw him in the boardroom where he controlled the world's largest concentration of mass raw egos in the chairman of the various <laughs> departments. And he was able to control those egos, direct those energies, and build the school. I saw him in the, in the uh, uh, room where he was with donors who loved their money and didn't like to part with their money but gave money that built the edifices now that are part of the Texas Medical Center and other uh, buildings and programs around the world. I watched him with uh, the Lasker Award and the committee uh, that are seeking excellence where uh, he, did, he did things differently and he managed things differently. I watched him in the military environment when he would go to uh, Washington and uh, deal with uh, uh, military projects. <clears throat> it was a different man, a different man. I watched him in the lecture hall where he would turn people on to an idea and he used a different technique. I watched him in the interview room as we were looking for new faculty and new residents. Again, a different technique, a different style, and a different purpose. He would, and then I watched him as we would write papers Again, a different attention, a different scope, because there was a different project. He was able to channel that project, that activity, that need to utilize the things he had at that time. He reminded me of an athletic coach that inherited a very young rookie team but was able to take the team that they were given and field a championship and direct those talents into new and different areas by making assignments. He took the issue of competition and made it the competitive uh, area of, uh, in other towns and other uh, medical centers where you, you wouldn't speak to each other, to be marathon runners where everybody set new records. 
because the competition was there, it was productive. So he was a man who was able, sometimes with very few words, to, uh, to channel those ener energies into productivity. I think you really captured him in a way that I've never heard done before. And it is, when I think about it, it's very accurate. Ken, <clears throat> I'm sure you, you view Dr. DeBakey as a mentor. Did you have other mentors? Dr. DeBakey taught me a lot without talking and with watching. Sometimes he taught me by criticism. Sometimes he taught me indirectly. Uh, many other faculty were at Baylor at the time, and uh, each of them taught me differently. George Jordan uh, ran the general surgery program and uh, uh, was probably as much as anybody my surgical father uh, in that I was with him every day. Arthur Bell was seen as a surgical senator. He was better loved and appreciated around the world than he was in Houston. But uh, in medical instrumentation, in device legislation, in the development of uh, uh, the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation uh, with that same activity of the college, he taught me that kind of organizational statesmanship. Uh, Stan Crawford and uh, George Morris uh, taught me uh, uh, the appreciation of big, bad, vascular and cardiac cases and the fact that if you go to the heart of danger, there you find safety. And uh, don't be afraid of the big bad case, conquer it. Um, and then innumerable other people that were on the faculty uh, uh, that were mentors, even those that were residents that were just uh, beyond me. It was an exciting time in uh, Houston between 1960 and 1990 when lots and lots of things were happening in surgery. Just explosive, wasn't it, Ken? Yes. Uh, Denton Cooley uh, was on the faculty, and uh, uh, Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey were uh, uh, really complementary of each other, mm -hmm. always were, always were, and they were the, the epitome of marathon runners, each setting records and causing the other to excel both contributing more than either would had the other not existed. Absolutely. It was that comment that I took to Dr. DeBakey uh, in uh, the latter years after his operation and said, Dr. DeBakey, it's time that these two marathon runners recognize each other's contribution to each other. And he said, let's do it. Ken, despite all these academic activities, your practice, teaching, you've had hobbies as well. The theater, reading on all subjects. By the way, what is your current book that you're reading? Well, actually, I'm electronically reading. I've, I've not bought a book in, a, in years. I, I read everything electronically. Um, I'm reading a book on uh, Lincoln's death uh, right now. I'm also reading several political books. I'm reading a book uh, uh, about the development of uh, uh, the writing of the Koran and uh, the Prophet Muhammad, who he was, what his education were, and what his families were. And uh, so depending on my mood on a given hour I, and, and the time, I, I will read those. Uh, I just recently uh, finished a book uh, written by the bodyguard of uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, that uh, fellow who climbed on the yeah. car, mm -hmm. and, uh, because I was resurrected uh, a project on was there or was there not somebody on the grassy knoll. Uh, so then I found a book to pursue on the car itself. And was there any bullet holes in the car, and uh, especially the windshield? And there was, and so I had to chase down that windshield. Uh, but but those are those kind of things are hobbies, uh, and um, so that's some of the things I'm reading. 
Now, what about chess? Who's your favorite chess partner? Oh, I, I haven't played much chess except with my grandson. That's recently. who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Now, have you met a gadget yet that you didn't want to master? Well, uh, the only difference in <laughs> the only difference in men and boys is the size and the price of their toys, and um, uh, I always like to have the newest gadget before anybody else does. Yes, you do, <laughs> Ken. In all of these things that you've been able to accomplish and and various things that that have been your focus, obviously time management is something that you've excelled in. Do you have tips for us on time management? Yes, but you don't want to hear it. Oh, yes, I do. No, you don't. You know, don't ask me a question unless you're willing to pursue it or the people who are listening or watching to pursue it. Uh, surgery is a discipline. Medicine is a discipline. Being a professional is a discipline. Time management is a discipline. It is a learned discipline that sometimes we need help with. Uh, I was influenced by a course I took my first year in college on time management. Mm. It was an extra course. It wasn't part of a regular course. The teacher forced us to divide the week into 15-minute blocks of time and then fill in for every 15 minute block of time during the week, what we were going to do with that 15 minutes. And we didn't finish in that 15 minutes. We moved on to the next thing in that 15 minute. So I actually practiced that for a long period of time. Every one of us waste almost 40 hours a week. 40 hours a week. And to prove that, if you'll take what you do during your week, everything you do in your week, brushing your teeth, sleeping, going to church, playing with pets, uh, reading a book, and you, 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 you're very liberal with your time allocation, and you add all those up, and then you add up how many hours there are in a week, you can't account for 40 hours. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on us. So um, uh, even assign time to leisure, to watch television, to watch the news, you still cannot account for 40 hours a week. We are responsible for the time we have. We're only given a very finite time on this earth to enjoy, to procreate, and to contribute. And if we don't leave this world a better place than we came to, you know, our time's been wasted. So use that time, don't waste that time, and so time management is part of our professional, our personal responsibility to, to society to say, we care for you, we're going to help you, and there's got to be a better way, and let's leave that better way for you to build on. This sounds like Minister Maddox is speaking now. <laughs> you only think it's minister because you've received that message of something you need to do. <clears throat> yes. Absolutely, and that course that you took really had an influence on you, obviously. Ken, now we have a series of questions that relate to your opinion. Not that all the questions before this have not related to your opinion. The first is <clears throat> the merger of SVS and ISCVS. Do you think this is beneficial or do you think this was harmful as far as a international exchange. Identities of individual groups of people that meet is important. Linkage of competing organizations is always good. Finances and sometimes uh, uh, restrictions on travel make it important to recognize that sometimes there's a better way. And quite honestly, I think this uh, merger is, is good for the profession. I think it does not go far enough. There are international groups and maybe even some uh, 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 peripheral groups 
that, uh, that probably ought to be part of the same merger. That doesn't mean they need to lose their name, but together they can meet to get, it can be uh, together. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a meeting next month in Brazil called the World uh, Trauma Congress. Hmm. And there's probably going to be 15 different organizations that are going to be there. The World Trauma Conference Congress is going to be one organization, but each of those individuals will have their individual identity, but there's only one program. So there's ways to accomplish it. And uh, sometimes it's only ego and past legacy that we try to hang on to. But I think it's a good thing. Ken, <clears throat> several years ago, a number of leaders in vascular surgery tried to establish an independent board of vascular surgery. Despite the fact that the membership voted in majority in favor of an independent board, board this failed. Why do you think this failed, and do you think this was a good idea? Things fail because they were not intended to be a success. Cream always rises to the top. It is better to work within an organization to make that organization better than to express problems with one's own self to say, I can't get along. Therefore, I'm going to form my own group. So uh, uh, it failed because there was not the substance to make it a success. Good minds, when they come together, may disagree, but ultimately will come to the right solution. Ken, as you know, when medical care exceeds 10% of the GDP, socialized medicine is soon to follow. American medicine costs have certainly exceeded 10% back in the 80s. This has finally resulted in the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare. American medicine has clearly now become a political football. Have we lost our way? And I know that you have had an experience of discussing this with some, some individuals very high in the current administration. What are your thoughts? Well, first off, you have opinionated the people who are watching this yes. video by the formation of your question. Correct. And you're opinionated yourself. Um, your figure of 10% is incorrect. <clears throat> Although the politicians, quote, 16 percent and higher, as we compare our way of calculating cost to other okay. countries, we only spend 7 percent of the gross domestic product mm. on health care. The remainder of that expense that's attributed to health care is spent on uh, a malpractice insurance, okay. administrative cost, okay. hassle factors, uh, lawyer cost, uh, administrators, Duplica duplication, and this is even admitted to by uh, President Obama in his presentation to the AMA. So, we're, if we use the way other countries are calculating, direct medical costs only are about 7%. Hmm. Indeed, um, various committees of our government, in order to produce a centrist control of health dollars created this Accountable Care Act that most of them hadn't read when they passed it. Right. There was AMA support, but the, I was in the room when that vote occurred and it was virtually 50-50 and great dissent, a lot of dissent. So the AMA did not give the support that the president said right. that they gave. Health care, as I said earlier, is local, just like politics and disaster care. If you apply a single centrist formula, you make literally what some people have called socialized medicine, and we have lost our way because we focus on what's political rather than what's needed at that local area. Let me give you an example. 
Many people are focusing on wellness and prevention. That would be lovely, but we're not addressing that at all in obesity, drinking, fast driving, uh, <laughs> diabetes, almost 50% of our population, and yet those are increasing, those are increasing. We, um, so wellness and prevention may not apply to the disease we're, we're, that's part of our, 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 our craft. Vascular disease is a degenerative disease that occurs partly because of genetics. We choose our ancestors poorly. Uh, and there may be some dietary component, but by the time we discover vascular disease, the diet isn't going to do a darn thing. So we've all got hung up on something that n the solution may not be the practical, simple way that we need to solve it. So um, um, I think we need <clears throat> a Flexner report 100 years later, sponsored by the major organizations of America, at the AMA, the American Surgical, Society of Vascular Surgery, the American College of Physicians, the American Hospital Association, go to some foundation, Robert Wood Johnson, the Bill Gates Foundation, and take five to 10 years to ask the questions, how do we practice medicine better? Medicare, Medicaid are actually a Ponzi game that we have reached the peak of, and we're in a collision course with a perfect economic storm that the bottom is falling out. I don't read anything in the current Accountable Care Act that is anything more than kicking a very large can down the road to cause our children and grandchildren to have to face the same problems we were facing 10 years ago. And the real issues of the economics of Medicare we're not dealing with, um, such as uh, uh, the sustainable growth rate. Uh, those bills don't even address that, don't even address that. Um, futility issues, probably 75% of the cost of health care is in the last six months to one year of life, much of it in futility issues. And yet we, we keep telling people, I want to keep you alive another week, another three weeks, on non-quality life at all. Is that what medicine's all about? Is that what the shaman forefathers of us? of ours going all the way back 8,000 years really intended for this, um, for this uh, uh, guild called medicine that no longer is a guild and is becoming a bunch of tradesmen. Let's talk about endovascular surgery. I read an article with Ken Maddox as one of the authors in which it was suggested that perhaps endovascular might be jeopardizing the management of vascular trauma. Is that true? Sure. I wrote that. <laughs> um, I write and say things at time to be provocative and to get you and everybody else to think. Right. That same year, at a meeting in New York, Randall Greep's meeting, I said, um, I think the first time in the United States that uh, if there's a role for endovascular surgery, it's probably in the transected aorta. This was probably 80s, 1987. And that uh, uh, the transected aorta, especially chronic transection, was the most ideal for a good uh, place to seat mm -hmm. the graft and a short segment and in individuals who uh, it would be readily applied. Um, no one picked that up, but I was trying to be provocative to say the technology needs to keep up with our needs now. And indeed, uh, endovascular's made advances, but there's still some technological challenge. And um, there's some cost challenges. To pay $12,000 for a single graft uh, is, is, is significant. Ken, in parting, do you have advice for young surgeons? 
Um, I've advised for all surgeons, and that is the volume of medical knowledge doubles every seven years, now probably every five years. And now with technological changes in the microchip and new products and new suturing techniques, uh, we, 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 ha we have tools and the future has tools that we never had. When you started in vascular, you had uh, vascular silk, uh, which was silk, which was waxed, but it still fractured very early. And then came polyethylene and yes. ultimately polypropylene. And polypropylene made a tremendous difference as well as the graft materials. So the advice I have to all of us, particularly young people, never be satisfied with what you have. Always figure out a, a better way. Always question your elders about the dogma they tell you is the only way to do a thing and leave the world better than you found it by building on the successes of the past and figuring out new ways to do new things, but base it on science, base it on need, and never lose your humanity and the reason you exist. I enjoy reading your book, The History of Surgery at Houston. It's, I just thought about wh whether you would consider to write one on the second generation of Houston surgeons. The book you wrote was the first generation. The second generation have a lot of fantastic surgeons too, like you, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Howell, Howell, George Noon, George Noon, um, Joe Caselli. I yes. mean, uh, just on and on, and George a lot Morris. of good ones. And I, I, um, I would encourage you to consider to write a second generation. I, because I, Texas, I, I have notes right now mm -hmm. on probably four books relating to Houston Surgical, yeah. Houston Surgery, uh, the Department of Surgery, yeah. Dr. DeBakey. Yeah. Um, uh, the second 25 years, uh, right. the, since Dr. DeBakey stepped down as chairman, yeah. there's been significant changes yeah. in four different uh, uh, paradigms yeah. in, in, mm -hmm. in both Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, there's been changes in Texas, uh, things uh, both in our government and uh, uh, tort reform, uh, the undocumented aliens uh, and their impact, <laughs> the changes in the ethnicity, particularly in Houston, uh, with the culture being one of our greatest assets. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, there's a bunch of fun things yeah, to write about. I think about. you should. And the second book I'd like you to write about is Debakey. We need to have a book on Debakey, and I think you know him so well you or George Loon or Tim with somebody together should write a book on DeBakey. There's uh, multiple books that could and should be written about DeBakey. Uh, and uh, um, it's almost like church and like family. Uh -huh. There are some things that are almost sacred and you don't write about. But then society would want to know about them, but do they really need to know about them? So uh, I struggle with the, the answer is yes. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, so exactly what tent it should take uh, and twist it should take uh, uh, depends on the mood of the writing day. This should be a good one. <laughs> From an outsider looking at Cooley, Debakey, they're fighting, and we all feel a little bit silly about the whole thing. What's your take on their relationship? They're always in the newspaper, talk about their fighting and everything. What, what, what's your take on the whole thing? Thank, thank you for the question. Um, I'm close to both men. Yeah. I've been close to both men. I have been one-on-one -on -one with both men when they could have said anything in the world they wanted to say to me privately. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay. 
I never, ever, ever, never, ever heard Dr. DeBakey say a fighting word or a crossword or a derogatory term Mm -hmm. about Dr. Cooley. One morning, Dr. Cooley, because of some investments, made the front page of the paper, Mm -hmm. and there was one of his hotels in Galveston, and it went bankrupt. And I showed that to Dr. DeBakey. We were one-on-one. And he said to me, after looking at the paper, be careful of investments and don't ever get greedy. I don't know if Dr. Cooley was greedy, but if you make two unwise investments, this can happen. That's the closest he ever came to a negative term. Likewise, I've been with Dr. Cooley. Dr. Cooley makes comments about competition, but if you listen carefully to what he says, it's really not derogatory. Dr. DeBakey, when asked about a conflict, a fight, and a feud, said we were never, ever in a feud. We were in a friendly competition a fierce surgical competition that was productive. Dr. Cooley said, yes, we competed for patients. We sometimes had different styles and we were in a very fast race. So to the world and to you and to vascular surgeons, Mm -hmm. I would say this was not a feud. This was on the productive side of a genome that was there to do best for what's good for patients. It was not a fight. It was what happens in academia all the time. If indeed it was ruthless, they would never have gotten back together as old golfers do at times after a good hard game of golf. (laughs) So yes, um, they were competitive. Yes, they were, there were disappointments. Yes, there were issues related to some specific uh, operations mm-hmm. and patients. And uh, uh, whether, but some of the criticism of Dr. DeBakey was generated by the newspapers, generated by the magazines mm-hmm. in an attempt to sell advertisement. There were other actions taken by NIH, mm-hmm by the IRB of Baylor College of Medicine Mm -hmm. that would have been taken against anybody that were attributed to Dr. Dr. DeBakey that were really a process issue. And that should not be forgotten. That should not be forgotten. And I really think that a book on DeBakey that would clarify a lot of those misunderstanding and all the thing. I, I really like to see you do it because you are the, the one that really well qualified to do it. And I'm looking forward to have you autograph it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think, you know, you have a tremendous publication list. The last article, number 608, is on endovascular. I just like to know from you your thought about this new technique how they change surgery in the future. Endovascular is much like radiology and uh, the ultrasound. It is a technology that is not unique to vascular surgery. It is a tool that vascular surgery has, has developed very well. We are going to teach endovascular to our general surgery residents as an approach beyond the vascular, beyond access, Uh, to include uh, things that interventional radiologists now do. So vascular surgery is going to have to learn to give up this uh, corner of the market that they currently have. Just like all of us will have to learn to share the skills that we develop. Well said. Ken, thank you for allowing this time for this important interview. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And Jimmy, thank you for the opportunity. It's always good to see you, Ken. Congratulations to the Texas Heart Institute on its 50th anniversary. The Texas Heart Institute has been integral to 
the Texas Medical Center uh, and to surgery and to vascular surgery, pediatric surgery, cardiac surgery for all these years. It's produced journals, books, surgeons, uh, and a, a lot of um, wonderful patients. It's been part, from time to time, of Baylor College of Medicine and is currently part of Baylor College of Medicine and the Texas Heart Institute's integrated thoracic surgery residency, one of the largest thoracic surgery residencies and most successful uh, in the country. Congratulations to Dr. Denton Cooley and to all of the staff and all the surgeons of the Texas Heart Institute on your many, many contributions and your many uh, wonderful uh, uh, saves and uh, patients who have uh, benefited from your skill and your dedication.